I, let's see how it goes. Um, so my name is Tor Wickfeldt. I've been in the Codefinery project from the beginning. And uh, today I will talk to you about reproducible research, different methods, different approaches to making your research more reproducible. It's a big statement, but uh, we'll see a few different isolated topics which all can contribute to making your research more reproducible. So let me start sharing my screen. And thanks, Richard, for covering all the details. Maybe I just want to say that here is the web page for the workshop. I hope you have it open somewhere. So it's codefinery.github.io slash, you can find it from the codefinery.org website. This is the URL. And, and the reason for keeping it open is that here in the schedule, we have direct links to all the lesson material. So we are here. Uh, we had dedicated a section with a mini introduction. Uh, that's maybe not really needed. Uh, you know the Zoom drill by now. You know that we are supposed to treat each other respectfully, follow the code of conduct. It's supposed to be comfortable, convenient for everyone. So raise any issues you have. Um, and uh, yeah. And then regarding last week, it had a lot of topics. It was very started gently with a Git introduction, but then quickly the pace accelerated. And, and of course, we know that we cover a lot of topics in quite a short amount of time. So there may be open questions. And I'm not going to recap those lessons from last week, but I, like Richard already mentioned, want to point you to the HackMD document where you can ask questions here at the bottom. And I do encourage you to ask questions from last week as well. So we are here to answer all your questions. Uh, so I see already some Git questions here from last week. And when you're not editing the HackMD document, it's good if you click the edit mode here so that uh, we don't overload the servers. With that said, I think I want to jump now to my lesson, reproducible research and fair data. So click this link, it takes you here. As I said, in this lesson, we'll cover different topics. What you'll need for the exercises is Git, Python, and SnakeMake. I hope most of you managed to install SnakeMake. Uh, if not, then this will be sorted out in the exercise later today. Docker and Make are optional. So we, I will discuss Docker briefly, but not go into any details because it's a big topic. And Make is sort of like, a, it can be used as an alternative to SnakeMake, but I will be focusing on the SnakeMake tool. What this means, what is SnakeMake, what is Make, what is Docker, we'll get to that in a minute. So let me jump into the motivation part, part one. We start with a comic. A PhD student is visiting the boss and gets a task. The professor is saying, don't worry, you don't have to start your code from scratch. You can reuse the software that the previous person on the project wrote several years ago. And the PhD student starts asking questions. Are there instructions for how to use it? Is the code commented? Where are the files? Who knows? He has no idea, the professor. This is going to be painful, isn't it? Just a scratch. This is a depressingly common situation, probably, with PhD students joining projects and have to start from scratch. There's nothing to build on. There's no documentation. There's no uh, code repositories. So he or she needs to reinvent the wheel. This happens over and over again in academia. And Git, like you learned last week, is actually the first step towards uh, addressing that problem. Another anecdote here, uh, also probably rather common. Shall I zoom in a bit like so? I've seen this happening uh, myself. So a group of researchers may obtain some great results, submit the paper, article to a high profile journal. Reviewers ask questions, of course, and ask for new figures, possibly different analysis. 
researchers start working on the revisions, generate modified figures, but find some inconsistencies or they cannot even reproduce the data. They can't, they can't re reproduce the figures. They can't find some of the data perhaps. They don't know which parameters they used when they were running their analysis and the manuscript is still languishing in the drawer. So this, this happens over and over again as well. But it shouldn't. So a little bit more discipline, better tooling can go a long way, as we'll see. So reproducible research, what is it? Uh, probably you already know, this is something you talk about and uh, think about in your work. So basically it's about duplicating the results of a prior study using the same materials as were used by the original investigator. So use the same raw data and the same analysis to and implement the same yeah implement the same analysis to try to give the same results so this means that for a research project an independent researcher should be able to replicate a, an experiment an experiment can be computational or or of course uh, like a physical experiment so the same results should be obtained under the same conditions but of course it has to be possible to recreate the same conditions in the first place that's part of reproducibility. Why do we include this lesson? Why is this important? Maybe you saw when the study came out uh, some years ago now that uh, Nature conducted a survey and it turned out that people worry about reproducibility in all disciplines, at least the STEM disciplines here. And a majority actually believed that there was a reproducibility crisis in science significant crisis half of people thought it was a significant crisis 40 percent thought it was a slight crisis and maybe many of you have experienced this firsthand not being able to reproduce uh, someone else's previous results or even your own so what leads to this what leads to irreproducible research there can be lack of documentation on how an experiment simulation is conducted, the data may be unavailable, software may be unavailable, it might be difficult to recreate software environment used originally, and it might be difficult to rerun the correct computational steps, the parameters are missing. So in this comic here, there's um, two math professors discussing and someone is making a derivation, then a miracle occurs. Of course, you should be a little bit more explicit than that. And you can see it as a pyramid, perhaps. This is one way of looking at it. So the published article is just the pinnacle here of the pyramid, but below it is this vast amount of work which needs to be where you need to be careful in, in order to make your article uh, reproducible. So you have documentation, code and data, and the environment. And in this lesson, we'll discuss the environment part here with containers. We'll discuss, uh, well, perhaps the code. You already learned about version control, but we'll talk about dependencies today. So that's important to get the code environment reproducible. And then we'll talk about workflows, how to uh, organize your analysis in, into workflows with uh, SnakeMake. In this case, it's one tool out of many which makes the data generation or the result, generating the results reproducible. Tomorrow, we have a lesson on documentation and a lesson on Jupyter. Those two tools may be more focused on the top two tiers here of the pyramid, as we'll see tomorrow. So reproducible is perhaps it can be seen only as the first step as well. You, a paper, an article, uh, or uh, scientific results in general, should perhaps also be replicable, robust, generalizable. So what does that mean? We'll talk about reproducibility today, but it's good to have this wider perspective in mind as well. So reproducibility is when you have the same data and the same analysis to get the same results. Replicable is different data, but the same analysis. Robust, same data, but different analysis, still get the same result generalizable, different data, different analysis. So it's good to have this perspective in mind. We can maybe leave these discussion exercises to the first breakout room. 
session. So if some of my colleagues could maybe copy paste this to like a breakout room session one section of the HackMD. It's impossible to discuss, I think, with 100 people in the room here. So let's talk about this in the first breakout room session. So it's about computer programs. They're expected to produce the same output for the same inputs. But is that always true? Have you experienced some other, some examples of this not being true? Okay, uh, that was the motivational part. I will jump to the next section here. Press the arrow at the bottom. And again, starting with the basics, maybe this is trivial to you, but it doesn't hurt to talk about it for five, 10 minutes. Simply, let's start with the directory structure of, of, of your projects, of all of our projects. So a good starting point is to keep all files associated with a single project in a single folder. Different projects should have separate folders. It's very useful for, for your future self and for your past self, your two main collaborators in this life, uh, to use consistent and informative directory structure. It helps yourself and it helps others. If you need to separate public or private or secret data, you can separate these by folder and Git repository. A readme file should be there to de describe your project perhaps containing instructions on reproducing the results. It's useful to discuss with your colleagues about how you do things and write it down. But of course, everyone's mileage may vary. One directory structure does not fit all projects. And of course, uh, considering this example here, when you, you write software which is reused in many projects, it can make sense to put them in uh, put the code in its own re repository. But here's just an example now. So we have a project, we have a readme file at the top level uh, root directory of the project folder. Uh, some raw data goes into this data folder along with a readme file to show where the data comes from perhaps. Some folder here for intermediate files from your analysis. Maybe you want to track the manuscript here. That's not a bad idea at all. Uh, final results, figures, and data files, tables can go into a separate folder. Your source files, your code here, along with a license, and along with a dependencies file. We'll talk about this in a minute. And you can keep your documentation here for the software inside the same, uh, inside the same folder. We'll see a, a concrete example of this in a minute. I think I covered all of these points here now. Just add maybe a, a final comment here is that um, it's not if you're tracking a full project like this with version control, like Git, and you're generating results, you're generating a new plot, you're generating new tables, figures, uh, numbers, it's not a bad idea at all to tag your results. This helps with reproducibility in the long run. So uh, tags are these uh, ways to put, uh, it's like a, so, sort of like a branch pointer that never moves in time. It always stays fixed to one commit. And this is great for re reproducibility because you can say, here is, uh, you know, this commit is the version of the code which I used for the results that I used in my thesis or in this paper. Reproducible publications. Um, this has a few different aspects, perhaps. So one is, is straightforward. So uh, how do you write your manuscripts? So I lived for many years during my PhD with writing them in, in Word files, because that's what my supervisors required. So we were sending each other big Word files, lots of figures, and they got version numbering, underscore initials, underscore initials, underscore final, and so on and so on. And that was terrible. I never want to go back there. Um, I just want to mention here that it's quite reasonable to use Git for, for writing your manuscripts and to co collaborate on manuscripts with your colleagues. You can write it just like we practiced a guacamole recipe last week, but 
there also are online tools like Overleaf, Authoria, and so on, which uh, support writing uh, LaTeX. Yeah, that's for LaTeX online. But of course, Google Docs is a perfectly reasonable alternative as well. So that was one part, just the concrete, how do you actually write the paper collaboratively, perhaps, with version control. But then uh, beyond the paper itself, it's worth mentioning that there are many tools that assist in making scholarly output uh, articles reproducible. One of these tools we'll discuss tomorrow, Jupyter Notebooks. So the idea here is, is that you can have something beyond just the written text to a supplementary material, perhaps, to help others reproduce your, your uh, published results. Uh, here's a tool from the R world. We have Binder that we'll see tomorrow. And uh, yeah, there are many innovations in this area, something here called Research Compendia. You can look it up later if you want. Uh, but these are tools that you can use to attach to your published articles as supplementary material to make your, your results reproducible to others. It turns out that it's not as easy to be perfectly reproducible as you might think, and perhaps that you might think even after attending a code refinery workshop. So if you, if you want to practice these skills, if you want to get a perspective on, you know, what are the key what, what are the most important things to do in order to make your research, research more reproducible? It's, it can be a nice experience to join one of these ReproHack events. The idea here, this is a link. Um, the idea is that uh, people get together for a hackathon, but instead of you know, suggesting your own uh, projects, you um, pick a paper from the literature, from your field perhaps, or some, some other field, and you try to reproduce it together with others. And it's, uh, it's a nice uh, type of event to, to learn some tricks of the trade. Uh, all right, so here is another discussion. I think I would like to wait with this also until the first breakout room session. So if one of my colleagues can, um, copy paste this also to the hack MD so that this becomes a part of the discussion in the first breakout room session. You don't need to discuss it in details, but it can be interesting to exchange views, exchange experience, because maybe this is not something you talk about every day in your, with your colleagues. So, but we're here to learn from each other and to discuss. So let's add this to the list of things to do in the first breakout room. Uh, I promised you a concrete example, and let's have a look at this example here. Word count. Um, I will open this link now in a new, a new browser tab. This is a small example project that we have prepared. It's um, borrowed or adapted from a previous experience, uh, like um, b b material from this group here. Uh, open source. So what is this? It's a GitHub repository. It appears to be a project that follows the guidelines I just discussed. So it has a data folder, documentation, the manuscript, process data, some intermediate files, results, source. I talked about a readme file. And that's actually the file that's displayed here, right? So if you have a readme file in your GitHub repository, it gets shown here on the front page of the repository. Where, and it's good to have a, at least a sentence, right? That describes in simple terms what this project is all about. So this project is all about counting words in a text, plotting a bar chart of the 10 most common words and testing SIPS law. So what is SIPS law? It's a funny or curious empirical observation from nature that if you rank phenomena, natural phenomena or man-made phenomena like height of buildings or sizes of cities or so on, they tend to fall on this log scale, log log scale. So or they tend to follow a one over n power law. And, and in the in the example of words, 
SIP's law, if, if SIP's law was to apply, it would mean that the second most common word would be half as common as the first most common word. And the third most common word would be one third of the frequency of the first word and so on. It's, it's just an example project. Uh, so we discussed this directory structure here, but there are some additional things here. So what do we have? We have a make, so the license is something we will talk about later today, choosing a license, but we have some other things. We have a Docker file, make file, snake file, requirements.txt. Some of these may be um, familiar to you, but this is actually what we will be discussing now for the rest of the lesson. What are these files and what, what problems do they try to solve? Okay, so I'm delaying all the interactive discussions between us to the breakout room. So I promise you that soon we will jump into an exercise session. Um, okay, I'll, I'll skip to the next episode now, episode three, where I will talk about dependencies and you will practice dependencies. What are dependencies? So our codes often depend on other codes and those other codes can depend on yet other codes and so on. So you can have dependencies, you import packages, you use libraries and so on. And all of these are dependencies. And we can think here about that, well, this is very relevant in the context of reproducibility. We can control our own code, but how do we control the dependencies? What if something changes? So here's a 10 year challenge or even a five year challenge. Can you, if you wrote code 10 years ago or five years ago, would you still be able to build it or use it? Is it usable? Are the dependencies still there? Or the code you're writing today, will it work in five years if you don't change it? Maybe, maybe not. So uh, dependency hell is a funny term, maybe just to highlight that um, uh, dependencies are actually quite tricky. So it's a complicated problem to uh, calculate dependencies between packages. And that's why we have tools to help us. And we'll see that in, in an exercise in a minute. So just to stay on the humorous side of things. So here's a, a cartoon of uh, the situation with Python. Not every one of you writes Python perhaps, but those who do, you might know pip, you might know that there's something called Anaconda, homebrew Python for Max. Maybe there's another pip here and oof, it's, you know, can be quite complicated. You have some system Python. And the comment here is that if my Python environment has become so degraded that my laptop has been declared a super fund site. A super fund site is, um, it's, uh, it's in, in the US, uh, when some area has become so contaminated by a factory or, or chemical spill spills that it, it gets lots of funding for cleanup. It shouldn't be this bad, but it's it dependency can be a, a tricky problem. And as I said, there are many tools that will help us to manage these things. Some of you may already use some of these. So what do these tools try to do? They try to solve a set of problems, installing a set of specific set of dependencies, possibly with well-defined versions, recording versions of, of dependencies, isolate environments on your computer for projects that might have conflicting dependencies. So you can have multiple environments that don't conflict with either that can uh, live in parallel, uh, even though they, they're not mutually compatible. So Python 2 in one and Python 3 in the other or different versions of libraries or same thing with other languages. Uh, isolate environments on computers with many users using, as I said, using different versions of Python or R. And these tools, some of these tools also provide services and tools to share packages with others. Okay, so we saw this requirements.txt file here in the 
word count example. So we have requirements.txt. This is how it looks. We have some packages. This is Python because we need to use something. Not all of you write Python, but I'm sorry about that. But uh, it's it's um, hopefully it's um, yeah, it's a simple example. Some of these packages are with explicit version. Others are not. So here's a hypothetical scenario. You're, let's say you're looking at someone else's code. Maybe you're interested in using it. You see that the code depends on a number of packages, but there's no requirements file. Scenario two, you do have a requirements file, something listing the dependencies, but there's no version. Scenario three, you have explicit versioning and maybe pointing to, you can also list actually dependencies pointing to particular commits on, on a service like uh, GitHub. Scenario four or D, all these packages are, are specified with explicit version number. So which one is best, which one is worst? So I think hopefully a key takeaway from today is that if you encounter a package uh, code that you're interested in using, it looks very interesting for your research purposes, but you don't have any requirements file or environment file, you should be skeptical. Uh, it might be difficult to use the code. It might have, it might not work as it should and so on. While this is, probably the ideal scenario here. You're very explicit with the version numbers. So keep that in mind. Um, in the world of Python, we have pip and pypi, so the Python package index. Uh, this is a standard place to share Python packages. And one can also have mixed language packages. Maybe some of you already use this, you can install packages or you can install them sp with specific versions. You can create a requirements file. So you set up your software environment in which your project works, and then you export it so that you can share it with others and put it on, add it to your, your Git repository. Uh, here's how you install from a, so, a, a requirements file like this. So if you have a requirements file, you can install all the packages with all the dependencies using this minus R flag. Conda is another tool which we are recommending in our installation instructions for the packages needed for, for a code refinery workshop. And Conda um, tries to do something in addition to pip. So it, it handles packages, but it also handles environments. Some of these other tools that I that were listed here, uh, virtual env, pip env, py env, poetry, they also have these func functionalities. But um, so we're not particularly recommending Condo over everything else. It's just it, it's it's a commonly used package manager and environment manager. So what does it do? It it manages a set of environments. For, by default, it has a root environment, and then it can have, uh, yeah, some additional environment, environment one, environment two, or maybe you can, it should rather be here, project A, project B. And you have this Conda installer, which uh, moves or installs packages into these environments. You can, and you can let it work on the different environments here. Uh, Conda is a part of Anaconda and Miniconda, but it's a standalone, uh, it can be installed standalone and used outside of these. It's uh, created by a company, but it has an open source BSD license. And it doesn't only manage Python packages, it, it can be used for other languages and binaries. And Miniconda is this very lightweight alternative to Anaconda. Anaconda is a big uh, distribution with, I don't know, 200 Python packages, all the which are commonly used in data science and 
and so on. And the corresponding commands for conda are conda install package, conda install package with a specific version. And here's how you create an environment. So either you just create an empty environment here, or here you can create an environment with this name starting using the information in this requirements file here all the dependencies from all the dependencies from this file uh, instead of specifying a name you can also specify a path which might help if you don't have right access to to the conda uh, central installation directory after creating an envir environment you first need to activate it and then you can work inside that environment, install additional packages if you want, and then when you're done, deactivate. You can list your environments. You can export a requirements file, just like I showed before, with pip. And you can also export to a different dependencies file called environment, or which is in YML file format, and the default the standard file name is environment.yml. So Conda can be used to share packages. I will not go into it, but if you're developing packages that you want to share with a community, with others, you can follow these instructions here to, to share a Conda package. And now we finally come to an exercise. Um, so we talked already about several aspects of reproducibility, and we had these discussion exercises. Let me see how it looks now in the uh, HackMD. Exercise session. Excellent. Thanks to you, whoever who, who made this. Um, where was it here? Here are the breakout rooms. And so feel free to discuss these questions now. Um, it's not every day that you have a dedicated discussion to reproducibility. So try and share some tips and tricks with each other. The helper can perhaps, uh, if possible, uh, start uh, to break the ice and um, you don't have to, you don't have to force it. Uh, spend a couple of minutes just uh, mentioning what what uh, what tools you use or how do you collaborate and so on. And then, so I, I merged these exercises together, right? So here's a a, a real hands-on uh, exercise when you're done with discussion. So uh, it's simply about practicing conda. Uh, just to get a flavor of how how you can isolate software environments and manage dependencies for different projects. Um, so the task here is to use the word count project, and I didn't do that already, so I, I'll, I'll do it now and tell you what it's all about. So what you should do is to first import this word count repository to your own GitHub. Because if you go here to the repository, you can see that this is a template. It's a template repository, which can be used to generate new repositories. So this is something you should do as well. I'll click this green button here. And I can name it, some, name it something under my own username on GitHub. I will make it a public repository. Uh, I guess, do we, yeah, I think we need all the branches here. So include all branches. And let's create this repository from a template. This is something everyone should be doing now, or you can do it in the exercise. Takes a few seconds. And you see now what happened is that it took the word count repository under the code refinery GitHub organization and put it under my my own namespace and it it shows me that this was generated from here and it comes with only one commit now so it creates a fresh repository without the git history it only has this 
initial commit, which contain, contains like a snapshot of the project, how it was at, at you know, the, yeah, uh, at, with it, it, one commit with all the changes here. Okay, so that was the first step. So import it and clone it to your uh, computers. Um, and then try and recreate the software environment provided by this requirements.txt file according to the, well, actually, here's a giveaway solution. This is the command you can use. It'll download all the packages listed in the requirements file. And when you're done, you'll have to activate this environment. And voila, you will have like an isolated software environment which does not interfere with anything else on your laptops. So you can then play around with these steps, inspect all the environments that you have. And then maybe a typical workflow when you're working on a project is that you need a new package. You decide to use pandas, for example, in Python. So you install it. And what you need to do next, you need to add pandas with the version to your requirements file. And then you can also play around with this YML file format. So try this alternative uh, way of, of creating an environment with Conda and export and put it into another YML file or put it into a YML file. And then, well, maybe it gets a bit rep rep repetitive here, but um, uh, if you want to practice, you can create a, a new environment.yml file, which is the default file name with the packages from the requirements.txt file because this file here uh, that you create automatically with this command is going to be a long package listing all the python packages but often it's it's enough to just list the key packages that you're using in a project so try and translate the requirements file to an environment file and if you want to make sure that it works you can create a new environment based on it and what's the time plan now? So I think we can spend um, 15 minutes uh, or let's say, yeah, 15 minutes on this. Let me just have a look at the uh, time now. We're roughly on time, I hope. So yeah, let's spend 15 minutes on this. And if uh, in breakout rooms, as usual, are there any questions first or anything that we need to do before we jump into the breakout rooms? Yeah, so the HackMD has places to answer all of the questions there so we can discuss together. And if you have other questions or problems during it, you can comment at the bottom. And if you say your, um, your breakout room number, we can send someone there to um, you yeah. can send someone else there to help. Yeah, good. So you don't need to write long essays, of course. It's just to you know take some collaborative notes. Maybe if, if someone comes with a good, you know, good solution to some trick, you know, something good tool, good combination of tools, it can be valuable to write it down here. So there's okay. a question: fifteen minutes for discussions and dependencies exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we come back and we have a, a little break after that. So until 10 o'clock now, or 10 o'clock uh, Stockholm time, uh, 11 o'clock in Finland. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I will open the, all the breakout room now. Good, thank you. Are we doing it on stream, on, on Twitch? Yeah, there's 11 people watching there. Okay. So.
Uh, I see several people who are remaining in the main room still. Uh, if, do, if you have any problem, just let me know. For your information, you might know, but the breakout room uh, icon can be found at the bottom of the, the main screen. If you hover over the bottom, then you will find it. Would you like to assign me to some room and I will go exploring them as usual? I think it might yes, be valuable. I will. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so as I wrote in that HackMD, there are a bit uh, kind of odd numbers that are assigned, but uh, you will see uh, where to go. Uh, I can just uh, assign except for tall because it's better to keep you here. So I was first, uh, sorry that I had some trouble at home. Uh, yeah. Well. And one person here in the chat is asking to be assigned to room seven. Okay. So he's not assigned. And we have several I did it, Fedor. Sorry. Size. Sorry. But maybe we should send a message to all uh, breakout room because uh, we have several messages asking oh, if sorry. 15 minutes for all the discussion plus the dependency exercise. So we maybe could clarify. Yeah. Uh, sorry. sorry huh? I'm sorry, I have some problem. It seems like that uh, there was some people who were not assigned to the breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. We can add five minutes, maybe, so to account I think for that. That might be a good idea. Yeah. yeah so let we can add. So uh, can you now we broadcast yes. a message that yeah. we we go until five minutes past the hour. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I did. So uh, I will send you guys. Uh, yes, so that I will send Yarno to room one and then uh, Radovan to room three and then Enrico to room four and on to room five and then Richard to. Can I send Richard as well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, to room six. And then okay. we are to room yeah. seven. And then so, Tor remains here. Yeah. So communicate with HackMD if you need me somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. When I disabled this uh, waiting room function, uh, then this problem of the kicking out uh, disappeared. You're muted, Tor. Yeah, when you disable what, sorry? Waiting room function. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so that's the people are, for some reason, being kicked out. But the, when they are coming into the wait, waiting room, and then they are already assigned to one of the breakout rooms, then they cannot come to the main room and then they are kicking out, or I don't know yeah. the mechanism, but it seems so. Yeah. yeah, so that's a bit fragile, it seems, yeah. Mm.
So do you have anything to say to the stream channel at all? Oh. Good question. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, until day three, that uh, it was some sort of exercises. So that's the instructor showed that how to do to the yeah, that's, uh, channel, that's, but this time thinking. it's a bit discussion. So yeah, I was thinking to actually do the exercise myself. So let me do that. Mm. Uh, so I already imported this template here, so I will clone it, clone it now. Yeah. Will you share screen? Oh, yes, of course. <clears throat> okay, so I, I copy paste it here, jump into my terminal and I will clone it. Hit clone. I'll have a look into this directory here. Here it is. What was I supposed to do next? I was supposed to um, use the requirements file to create a new Conda environment. Mm -hmm. And I can simply copy this command here. So I, I will name it word count. I will use the requirements.txt file. I will use the bioconda and the Conda forge uh, channels, which are like repositories online containing packages. So if I cat my requirements file, I can see that these are the packages needed. So let me just uh, paste this command then, conda create. Now it will collect the metadata and try to resolve all dependencies, figure out what, if it can install things and if the versions are available. This worked yesterday. I don't know why. It, yeah, it worked fine yesterday. So let me just open a new terminal here. List my environments on the info minus e. I will. I will. Uh, what will I do? I will. Oops. Oh, no need. It it managed. It did manage here to resolve all the uh, dependencies, and it's currently creating my environment. Oh yeah. Okay, so it installed all the packages. Actually, unfortunately, sorry, the output of this command vanished here because I have this tmux uh, split screen thing here so that you can see my last commands here. But this 
in this case, it means that the output actually vanished. Uh, but what it was telling me is that in order to use this new environment, you need to activate it. So I can just list my environments. Conda info minus E or minus minus ENVs. I have this word count now. I can do conda activate word count. Ah, sorry, I have to drop out of the uh, Tmux split screen because it doesn't work very nicely. Uh, yeah, so let me do it again. Conda activate word count. Now it's not there. I messed things up a little bit. Conda info minus E. Because I was using the split screen thing, somehow the name was not registered. So let me just uh, activate it like this. Conda, activate, and then the full, oops. Conda, activate the full path. Here we go. My terminal is showing me that I'm now in the word count environment. I can do a conda list to see which packages I have. Okay, these are my packages. And let's say now I need pandas because I'm developing some code and I decide to use pandas. I can do conda install pandas and let's take a recent version here, 103. Let's say that's the one we want. So yeah, I mentioned that dependencies can be, mathematically they're a difficult problem to calculate. So Conda does not always succeed right away with resolving the dependencies. So it's retrying now with a flexible solve. In the meantime, I will jump to my browser and have a look here at the discussions. Okay, nice to see there are already some good comments here. Sorry guys, this is taking time, so. It'll be interesting to hear if participants in the breakout rooms actually have better luck than I. My conda is acting up a little bit. Mm. That did not go well at all. I will do it differently, I think. I made a mistake there to create the environment from within my existing environment. Mm. So you see here that the word count environment was created underneath my special code ref, code definary environment. Mm -hmm. So what I should have done is maybe to deactivate first. And you see now I drop into the code ref environment and I should deactivate once more, mm -hmm. like so. I'm in the base environment now. 
and now I should actually use the conda create command. I probably will not have time to do this before we uh, reconvene. I should go into the word count directory first. Yeah, it's two minutes to go. Yeah, I'll do this, but let's see. Shall I say to them two minutes to go? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Anne says, it obviously takes a bit of time to create new environment. I'm not sure that time allocated will be sufficient for everyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So curiously, oh, now I figured it out. This took not this long for me yesterday. So I don't know if I changed something in the meantime, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it's not always perfectly smooth or it can take some time to resolve these dependencies. Mm. Yes, so I sent a closing message now. Okay, good. There are also reports that a couple of rooms I've seen will not finish, finish creating the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Activate my environment. Yeah, people back? Yes, I think so. 96 participants, okay. So that means that everyone is back, I think. Yeah. Okay, welcome back. I hope you had, I know you didn't have time to finish everything. You didn't have time to have an in-depth discussion and solve a practical exercise. So sorry about that, uh, actually, Using Conda sometimes takes a while. So in my case, it took longer than it took yesterday for some reason. So solving the environment, trying to resolve all the dependencies can be a bit tricky sometimes. It's a complicated use, mathematical problem. Yeah. Can everyone use the no if you did not finish the exercise? Yeah. And yes, if you did. And if you did enough and don't want to, but don't think it's worth it, then leave don't vote yeah there's a huge number of no's here yeah so we don't want to say that conda is the only tool here obviously i mean many people prefer conda others prefer pip or pip end uh, maybe the impression from from today is that conda is slow or or useless but <laughs> it usually works a slightly more uh, fluidly than it did for me right now but I don't think we have to spend more time on the exercise now. People can work on this at home after the workshop. Do we need the Conda environment for future exercises? No, we don't, no. So this was just an exercise. You can throw away the environment after finishing. Uh, so I'll show here that if you created a new environment, you can either use this Conda and remove and then the name of the environment command or simply remove the directory where it's installed because it's very isolated. 
Okay, so I think it's time for a break. I'll just wrap up here that there are other environment management tools and dependency management tools. Many for Python, as I said, there are some good options for R as well. In C, C++, there are these other tools here and probably many others for other languages, Java and so on. So the key points here are that capturing the, depend capturing the dependencies is a must for reproducibility. So you should be using files like requirements.txt or environment.yml or pipend, and they should be part of the source repository. And be skeptical when you see a dependency list without versions, because the five-year challenge, you know, will this work in the future? All projects develop with time, and often things break. Things, new developments are often not backwards compatible. Those are the take-home lessons. It's not a simple problem, but uh, using something like these files here is a hundred times better than using nothing. And with that, I think we should uh, break, uh, have a break, 10 minutes at least. Um, is 10 minutes good? Okay, let's go. Would you like to put, would you like to make the offer of people to go to the breakout rooms during the break? I guess you can open the rooms and if you want to stay here, then um, don't click join breakout rooms. If you want to, then click join. Yes, I can open the breakout rooms when the breakout break starts. Mm -hmm. What to say, Tor? Or, yeah. or we should all have some break. <laughs> uh, someone says great idea here in the chat. So some people at least like it. So let's open the breakout rooms and people can work there if they want. Otherwise, it's perfectly fine to go and grab coffee and do whatever you want. But we reconvene here in the main room at 20 minutes past the hour. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Okay. X, X yes. 20 is the time. We will reconvene at 20 minutes past the hour. So I will open the breakout rooms, uh, but uh, I will just, I, I, I have us unassigned this uh, CR stuff from the breakout rooms. So uh, I will open it, but uh, when the CR stuff wants to join, just let me know, then I will sign. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, so I will Thank open you. it. And I'll be right back. I have to yeah. grab coffee.
Tor, can you see that chat message? One has a file not found error. Not able to install the Alabaster package. Um, why is that? I'm not sure. I think Alabaster is in the Conda Forge channel. So, hmm. For the current purposes, it's not needed to install the Alabaster package. You can you can cheat and take it away from the requirements file. But it's a bit annoying that it's not found here. So what the command is installing from uh, using the channels Bioconda and Conda Forge. And as far as I remember, it was supposed to be there, the, the package that it fails with. So I don't know the immediate solution to this problem, unfortunately. We can try and solve it in a in a breakout room. Or we can probably easier to discuss it after 12 o'clock today. If someone wants help with with this exercise, if something failed, I think it's best if we discuss it at 12, after 12, if people can hang around for a while. Any other question? Let's see. Sorry, I'm yes. Are we back? Yes. Okay. Good. So I will have to leave the dependencies discussion for now because there are other topics to cover. Some people probably ran into some problems with um, Conda. Uh, dependencies are complicated, like I said. Many things can go wrong, but uh, we can, if anyone wants direct help with solving technical issues, uh, I think we'll have to postpone that until 12 o'clock when I will stay around and probably many of my colleagues, and we can try to help individual people get it working. So for now, I will, I will share my screen again. And let's move on with the material. Uh, here we are. This is the lesson we've covered up until here. I will now briefly discuss envir recording environments. And, and then we go into workflows and computational steps. So, this is the bottom rung of the pyramid that I showed in, in the beginning. So uh, how to create a fully reproducible software environment with operating at the operating system level. And that's where containers come in. So containers can be built to bundle all the necessary ingredients, the software, but also data and the environment. Uh, so it's an operating system level virtualization method which shares the host system's kernel with other containers. And two popular implementations are Docker and Singularity. 
Docker is available for most operating systems, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. And it can be seen as a method to send the computer to the data. So for example, uh, when the data is too large or too sensitive and so on. And Docker Hub is a platform where Docker images can be shared and they're stored there in repositories, sort of like Git repositories. And all public Docker images or many public Docker images are available on Docker Hub. There's a warning here to only use official and trusted images because there are contaminated images out there. Uh, there are some examples of what you can do. You can run a specific version of RStudio and, and so on. I don't want to go in, into any details here. This is just to mention that containers can be a powerful tool to manage uh, the environment in, in very much detail. If you want others to be have the, exactly the same environment as you have. <clears throat> and I also want to flag singularity here as uh, an alternative which is more aimed towards the scientific community. And it can be used to run scientific workflows on HPC. So Singularity works on HPC. And it's good to know that Docker images can be converted into Singularity images. So what are these things? Container, image, recipe. <clears throat> these are three concepts that, are, that you'll hear in, uh, in the discussion of containers. So the image is sort of like a blueprint, it's immutable, while containers are the actual instances of an image. And you can have multiple containers running active at the same time. And uh, this is, I should say, also how the cloud mostly is implemented. When you spin up an instance in the cloud to work remotely, that's a container running somewhere, together with many, many, many other containers from other people. A Docker file, oops, is sorry about that. A Docker file is a recipe, which uh, creates a container based on an image and applies often some small changes to it. So it's often the best way often to create to work with containers is to specify Docker files. And you could see here in the uh, where did I go now? You can see here in the word count example that there is indeed a Docker file. So this is the word count project again, which I imported. You can see there's a Docker file, which has some directives here. It's derived from an Ubuntu image. That's like the parent image. Uh, and then it, the file here, the recipe file, the Docker file, specifies what to do. It should first update the packages, then install these these uh, packages here, uh, pip install a few packages, set some environment variables, um, run a command. This is to create a symlink. You don't, don't worry about the details, I just want to point out that there are these directives here that you can specify in a Docker file. And then here's a way to copy data into the uh, into the container. So the container is like an isolated piece of software containing the, all the dependencies, all the system libraries, and also data if needed. Okay. So there are some pros and cons. Containers are very popular for a reason. So they allow for seamlessly moving workflows across platforms. They're more lightweight than virtual machines. You, if you don't know much about containers, you might still have heard about virtual machines. Containers are more lightweight. They share the system kernel with other containers. They're not a fully isolated computer inside a computer like virtual machines. Containers can eliminate this problem on, of works on my machine that, that you may have experienced. For software with many dependencies, which in turn might have many other dependencies or dependencies of dependencies, of dependencies maybe, containers can, can offer maybe the only solution to preserve the computational experiment, the computational environment for, a future, for being future reproducible. But there are some drawbacks with containers. They can have security vulnerabilities, like, like I mentioned. It could be used to hide away software installation problems. So if you're developing 
yeah, you might encounter something that is extremely difficult to install on, the, on your computer. And the only way to install it is using a container. That's maybe not an ideal scenario. And it may not be clear whether to record the environment in the image part or in the recipe part. So I just wanted to briefly mention containers because they are used a lot right now. And it might be something you might want to look into. Uh, with that said, I will now go into workflows, recording computational steps. I will give you a brief introduction and then we will do an exercise. So first you should be cloning your, your word count repository that you imported earlier from the template and step into it. We didn't really focus on the actual project before, so let me jump to my terminal here. I'm in the word count uh, directory, and we see that under the data folder, we have a license file, and then we have some text files here, and these are actually books in the public domain, which come with this repository here. Uh, text files here. So this is the yeah, Scott's last expedition in two volumes. Uh, and then we have the source directory here, which contains the analysis scripts. We have a word count uh, file, a plot count file, and a zip test file. So how does this project work now? Uh, these are the steps in order to generate the results. So you first call the word count script on a particular data file and you place it under, uh, you, you provide an intimate, intermediate file here in the process data folder. So the, I'll just copy paste this now, let's try it out. You can type along if you want, but you can also do it later, it's fine. Uh, I'll copy paste, here I am. What happened? It placed a new file under the process data folder. Let's have a look at it. Oops. It counted all the words in the text and ranked it. Let's have a look at the first line. So the is the most common word, 6% of the time, six, 7% off and, and so on. The next step is to plot that data. Let me do it like this, I copy paste. It now put a figure, a histogram. I can use the open command on my Mac here. Yeah, it's, it's a nice histogram here. And the final step, is to run the SIPF test. So I told you that this was this empirical observation that things tend, yeah, many things in nature tend to follow this one over n distribution. Sorry about that. So here is my terminal. Okay, so it actually only compares the first and the second word. And in this case, the ratio is 1.55. So it's not quite two like the law is suggesting. Okay, so that's the project. There are now some, just as a thought experiment, let's uh, compare a few different solutions to uh, working with this project. So let's say you're, you're doing this research and there are different ways of actually performing these steps. The first step hypothetically might, the first approach might be to use some sort of graphical user interface. How would that work? Let's say you would, uh, this is just a very uh, crude uh, description, but it might work along these lines for some uh, graphical user interfaces. You click on the counting script, select a book text file, give a name of the DAP file, click on a run symbol, click on a plotting script, and so on and so on. You see that this is a lot of mouse clicking. Might get tedious after a while. Solution two would be to run it manually, just like I, I just did now. 
to I already I did the full workflow for one of the source files. I ran the word count and then the plot count and then I did the SIF test. So you could do this one by one for each of the data files. Uh, this is imperative style. We tell the computer first do this, then do that, then do that, and finally do this. You might get bored and introduce a script. You might write a, a bash script or some script which loops over all the data files here automatically. And then you can run it. And this will run, uh, it'll loop over all the data files and yeah, go through the full analysis here. This is clearly an improvement, right? Is there a need to go beyond this? Do we need anything else than scripting things? Well, that's where tools like Snake may come in. They automate it to an even greater extent. And they have some other advantages that might be interesting to you. So Snake Make is inspired by GNU Make, this ancient tool from the 70s, which was has been used a lot to compile code, but it can use, be used for many other purposes, like scientific workflows. But Snake Make is, is more general, and it has somewhat easier syntax. It's based on Python. And let's inspect this Snake file. If you know Make, you might know Make files. So the corresponding thing with snake make is a snake file. A snake file is essentially a Python script, but it has some language extensions. So this doesn't look very familiar as Python, but this is, um, these are extensions to the Python syntax now. Uh, what does it have? It has rules. So any Python syntax could be added here, but the most important thing are normally these rules. You can define some local rules here. An all rule, I will go into detail what this means. We have a rule called count words. And here maybe we can try and figure out what's going on. So this rule, which is called count words, has some input. One of the inputs is the script itself. Another input is, the, is, is a text file, but you see there's a sort of like a wildcard thing here. So we have parentheses, angular, curly brackets, file. So this is clearly something that is general. You don't need to hard code the actual names of the uh, files here. It's the rule also specifies where the out, output should go, where a log file should go, and what command should be run to generate the output from the input. That's here. Uh, there's another rule for making plots another rule for making uh, the final step of the analysis to run the SIP test. And then there's an additional rule to archive everything, to tar it into a tarball. So here's a cartoon to show, or like a schematic way to understand uh, the snake file. So essentially this is what it boils down to. We have a target with, well, the, a rule is, is, yeah, so the inputs are like dependencies. The outputs are the targets of a rule. And then we specify a command to generate the outputs from the inputs. And let's try this out. I will just copy paste this uh, command into my terminal. And I will tell you what it, what it does. Let me just clear my screen first. I will copy paste here. So I just add this uh, delete all output uh, flag here at the beginning in order if you if you already ran a command which generated these intermediate files here you can clear them by using the delete all output so snake make figures out what are the output files what are the targets using the uh, that defined in the snake file and this flag here simply deletes it if I list this directory again, ah, it actually doesn't delete the PNG file. Anyway, it deletes the, the data file. And then we run snake make minus J1. Why do I do J1? So in previous versions of snake make, this was not needed, but since version 5.10 or so, you need to specify how many um, cores or how many parallel processes should be used 
when executing the workflow. This will become clear in a minute, hopefully. If I run this now, okay, so what's it doing? It's stepping through the rules and it's running the jobs, the steps defined in the rules. Apparently there are 11 steps in total. So based on this snake file here, snake make figures out what needs to be run in which order in order to create all the output files. And this is not imperative style, but uh, declarative style. We don't describe step by step what Snake makes you do. We just describe the dependencies, how files relate to each other, and we let Snake make figure out the series of steps which are needed to produce the results. If we run this now again, Snake make minus J one. I run it once more. Snake make now figures out that nothing needs to be updated. So if, if you were instead using a script, uh, you would always be forcefully rewriting all the files when you run the script, right? But Snake make figures out now that all the targets have been built, nothing has changed, no, no uh, dependency has been updated, and therefore I don't need to rerun anything at all. So this can be a time saver. Okay, soon we will, yeah, I will show one more thing now. So let's try something. Let's, one part of the, the one of the final steps here was to uh, create this results file. So let's have a look at the results file. It collects the, uh, this ratio for all the books. What if we now, sorry, if we touch this file, if we pretend that it's been updated, let's say we, yeah, we pretend that this file has been updated using the touch command and we rerun snake make, what will it do? It will only run one of the rules because it figures out that it doesn't need to uh, run the first rules, the first steps of the workflow. It only needs to run this very final rule here because the final rule, which creates this uh, zip, uh, the, the tarball, depends on the results.txt file. This will hopefully become clear now when you do an exercise. I just want to summarize that uh, we're not saying that everyone should be using SnakeMake. There are many, many tools out there that might fit your use case or your discipline, your scientific discipline. But SnakeMake has a gentle learning curve. It's free and open source, installs via Conda or PIP, works on different operating systems and compatible with HPC schedulers. And you can use the same workflow, the same Snake file uh, on a laptop and a cluster. If you used to make, uh, you, this will be a little bit familiar to you. The difference is that snake files are Python based. Snake make is Python based and any, anything that can be done in Python can be done with snake make. There are also some things that can only be done, other things that can only be done in, in snake make and not in make, like defining isolated software environments for each rule. And you can run workflows in Docker or Singularity containers. And workflows can be pushed out to run on a cluster. This is an example of how uh, you can use isolated software environments. So you can have a rule, give it some name with the dependencies and the targets, the output. And then you can use this conda directive here to say that this rule actually needs this particular software environment. So that's pretty cool. Uh, if you want, you can visualize the workflow using this minus minus DAG, directed acyclic graph, and it gives you a, a visualization of the workflow, how different steps relate to each other. So discussion, these different approaches going from a GUI to SnakeMake, clearly the latter approaches, at least SnakeMake and writing a script are uh, more reproducible. It's much more easy to make a mistake with uh, a GUI. 
And clearly the last two approaches also scale up to arbitrary number of, of data files, much more automated. There is an experimental graphical user interface. As I said, you can use Snake, Make, and HPC. I want to go into details here. Here's how you can run jobs in containers. You can say that this rule should use this container here if you have Singularity installed. And here's the a, a link to the official documentation of Snake Make. So let's do an exercise now uh, for 15 minutes where you use Snake Make. Clean the output using this delete all output flags and run Snake Make. Take note of how many jobs are run. Try touching one of the data files, the, the books, and rerun Snake Make which steps of the workflow are now run and why only those. Try touching one of the intermediate files, sierra.dat, for example, and rerun SnakeMake. Can you make sense of the output? And then try touching one of the source files and rerun SnakeMake. Why are these steps run? Is it good to include source codes as dependencies. Think about that. And then you can try parallelizing. So this is a nice feature of Snake Make and also of Make that it, it detects which steps are independent of others and can therefore be run in parallel using all the cores on your computer. If you finish this one early, you can have a look at using Snake Make with Conda environments. You can, uh, yeah, it's an optional exercise. So if you're interested in that, you can read the steps here. And after we're done with this exercise, we'll go back um, and summarize and uh, answer any questions, I guess. So I think we uh, can have a 15 minute exercise for this until 11 o'clock. Yes, so may I open the rooms? Yeah. Yes, I will open the room. I just realized that I haven't covered the, I moved the, access, the episodes around yesterday, so there will be very little time for the sharing code and data. I think I'll just, so Anne is after me, right? Yes. Yeah, I guess I'll just have to skip it. I'll, I'll briefly say what it's all about. No, don't skip everything because there are some important. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I think it's okay. I mean, the uh, the social coding is uh, is mostly. I want to have a discussion at the beginning, and then uh, uh, we can go through the material quickly. Quickly, I want to put emphasis on the citation part and the, a bit on the licenses, but uh, it's mm. okay. You you can uh, make sure. I think there are important aspects. So if, if you go, I don't know, like quarter past 11. Okay, I'll, yeah, absolutely latest, I'll go on. Thanks, yeah. It's a shame to skip it, of course. So I wonder if Sandbox and Odo is up. No, Sandbox and Odo is actually down. If you want to show it, what we could also do is we we create a DOI record for one of the lessons. I mean, we create a release as a demo, or we something that we wanted to. If we want to really show show it, mm. otherwise you could do all the clicks except actually creating it. So yeah, you could like do the switch and then show that if I now would create a release and click here, create release, I would get a DOI. Yeah, yeah. Or we go to some existing ones. 
No, I think it's good to just show that, you know, here you flip the switch and then you get a DOI. And yeah. Yes, so I see again that several people are remaining in the main room. In case you haven't noticed, uh, the breakout room session icon can be found at the bottom of the Zoom main screen. If you hover the uh, the pointer over the bottom of the Zoom screen, then you will find it and then you can go to the breakout room. If you have any question or uh, problem, just let me know. And then I will assign all the CR uh, except for tall members uh, to the breakout rooms. Mm. So now you have, yes. to, you have to assign me to at least one room so that I'll get that button so I can uh, yeah. jump over. Yes, uh, I will. And, and the other thing uh, too is it seems that the updating Conda has solved that uh, Conda issue they had. I see some message on chat. Yeah, okay. I see that too. Yeah. <coughs> so you are not to breakout room one and then uh, rather <coughs> one to breakout room three and on to breakout room four and then Richard to breakout room five and then summary to breakout room six and then uh, uh, Bjorn to sorry to breakout room did I say seven I didn't probably let me see yeah so I will send Bjorn to breakout room seven Rather, well, I assigned you to the breakout room three. Oh, yeah, I sh probably should have clicked something. I, I was before in breakout room three, and they had a good discussion going. So, mm. if there is another breakout room which is, okay. I don't know, needs, <laughs> so I don't think they need me. I, yeah, I, was, well, I was just writing things down. Yeah, I will send you to that breakout room 10 then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Tor again about to this exercise to the stream viewers. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I was having having a look at the comments in the HackMD. HackMD, yeah, great, yeah. Uh, so. great discussion there. So I can share my screen again. Uh, here we go. So where are we? We are here. So. Let me start by running snake make minus minus delete all output. This will clear. Actually, I need since a recent version, now it's obligatory to give this minus minus course or minus J option. It's a bit annoying, I must admit, but I'll just do it. Minus J1. I need to tell snake make to run only one process. It deletes all the outputs here, as you see. Um, so I will rerun the workflow with snake make minus J1. If this will run all the rules, finally, and ultimately the all rule here, creating the tarball. You see, it just created this file here, oops, this one. If I run snake make minus J1 once more, Nothing happens, nothing needs to be done. So what if I update one of the dependencies? So let me update one of the books. One out of four data files I will update by using the touch command. Touch simply updates the timestamp of a file. 
and Snakemake will uh, use these timestamps. It'll see based on the timestamps if any targets need to be rebuilt because any of the dependencies have been updated. So if I now rerun snakemake minus j1, so we had 11 steps in total. What if I run it now? It will only need to run five steps. Maybe we can try and make sense of this based on the this one here. So we updated one of the uh, source data files here. So what it needed, needed, needed to do was to run this rule and this rule to create a new plot. It needed to run the SIP test again. It needed to create a new archive. And then there was this all rule, which simply triggers all the workflow to be executed. So it didn't need to touch any of the other uh, rules here. It didn't need to make new plots or new intermediate data files for the other <clears throat> other book files. So that's pretty neat. Where am I? What if we touch one of the process data files? So touch processed, let me touch the Sierra one and rerun it once more. Now it only needs to run four steps. So same idea. It it knows it figures out what needs to be run rerun and what doesn't. Let's touch one of the source files. Source which one? Let's word count. Make make. Yep. It does what it should because we were clever enough. It runs all eleven steps. It's clever enough to, we wrote it in a clever enough way, this uh, snake file, to use the, to have the source files as uh, dependencies. Because of course, if you change one of the source files, this can be, of course, doesn't matter what it is. It can be a Python script. It can be a C, C++, Fortran code or whatever. If you change it, the analysis has to be rerun because the results might be different. So the, the, the tools it, themselves, the code, uh, should be a part of the dependencies. Finally, parallelization. Let's see if we can save some time now. I will uh, clear all output first. got one and I will run the regular snake make command here with the time command to see how long time it takes. So using only one core, J1, I could also type minus minus core one cores equal to one. It takes, well, 5.8 seconds here. Let me now clear the output. And let's run it with two cores. It took shorter. It didn't take half of the time because many of these steps are serial, right? If you look at the workflow, it SnakeMake figures out that these four rules can be run independently of each other. Also, the plotting rules can be run independently, but the SIPF test is serial, making the archive is serial. In real case scenarios, of course, you might have much more computationally demanding problems where it can really make sense to have a, uh, to have to actually run in parallel. And as I said before, it can also be uh, copied over to a cluster and run there. And speaking of clusters, if you play around with this command here, this is a, a 
convenient command to transfer a full workflow to another machine. This minus minus archive flag to SnakeMake will uh, compress uh, and compile everything that's needed for the workflow into a tar.gz file. So it tarred it here. And this you could copy over to another machine and run it there. Okay, it's soon time to get back, I think. Yes, it's a bit more than one minute. At all, did you see that the HackMD message? Which one? Uh, could you add step-by-step -step instructions for exercise using SnakeMake breakout room 11? Yeah, it, it's been that? added already. Okay, someone, good. Someone already added the command step-by-step. -step. Oh, yeah, here is, that. these are the steps. Step. Yeah, okay. So I will send this closing message to the all rooms now. Mm -hmm. So Thor, after this, uh, I'm going to have a break or how is your plan now before I end? I will uh, talk for five or 10 minutes and then maybe five minute break. Five minutes, okay. So I had, I had to go to another meeting, so I'll be back in another 10 minutes. And then okay. Uh, yeah. uh, I guess you don't, you have not planned any um, group group work now. You're just going to show some things. Yeah, I'm That's just going to show. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, Thor, yeah. There's a recent, uh, recent um, <coughs> issue on Snake Make that there, the AUX uh, directory name is not allowed for files on folder on Windows. There's something that broke Snake Make on Windows. Um, this is a week ago, or a little bit more. Oh. Uh, okay, so we, indeed we have we had problem with snake make on Windows. Yeah, so but but yeah. the issue has been closed. So I guess it's been corrected again. But but I think this has hurt several users. Okay. So it was in one version of snake make then. Yeah, it could be. Okay. So I'll, yeah. I'll paste paste the the link in the HackMD. So yeah. Okay. So I think everyone is back. Welcome back. Sorry again for interrupting you. I know it's always too little time for exercises. And again, many of you maybe ran into some issues. There was some problem with a version of Snake Make on Windows. Anyone who wants to have get things running, get problems fixed, uh, please, um, if you could stay around after 12, after, after the workshop ends today, and we'll be happy to help. Okay, so hopefully some of you at least got a flavor of what you can do with Snake Make and how it works and possibly someone even tried to use a conda environment. I just want to conclude that GUIs may or may not be reproducible. Many of them can be automated, but many cannot. And they're in general, the level of reproducibility is not quite as high as when you script things or use a tool like SnakeMake. <clears throat> so SnakeMake and, and and friends, similar tools are great for longer multi-step analysis and this parallelization feature that the tool like SnakeMake can detect which rules are independent of each other and can therefore be run in parallel can be very convenient if you have more computationally heavy uh, workflows than what we looked at today. 
here's a link to another interesting new development. If I click this uh, link here, Specialized Frameworks, this actually is a GitHub page with a huge number of workflow tools. It's up to over 200, three, almost 300 workflow tools, which are developed for different purposes. Some are general purpose, some are uh, specific to particular disciplines and so on. So you see that uh, it's a, an important problem that many people are trying to solve in different ways. So the key points is to preserve the steps for yourself in the future and for your collaborators to be able to regenerate published results. Many such tools exist, of course. SnakeMake is one of those. It's comparatively simple and lightweight. But of course, sometimes a script is completely fine and completely enough. I will now spend only a few minutes here on sharing code and data, which is the next episode. And then I'll leave the word to Anne to talk about social coding. So sharing research data. Only sharing the publication might not be enough, right? There is the open science movement, which is growing stronger every year which advocates for sharing other research outputs, data, code, methodology, and so on. There are some arguments in favor and some arguments against, but I think as a whole, many scientific communities are, more, are moving towards more open science, more open access, and so on. So all the different parts of a research life cycle can be shared and uh, this is great for reproducibility. You might have heard about the FAIR principles. This is a recent buzzword started in data management. So FAIR, it's an acronym. It stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So data is useless unless, or pretty, it can be quite useless unless it um, agrees or uh, follows the, the FAIR principles here. So People need to be able to find your data. Here we're talking about data, but this applies equally well to code. Findable, what's the solution? It's to put your code or your data in a standard repository and get a digital object identifier. And I'll show you how to do that. If people know that the data exists, can they get it? Or is it paywalled? Uh, interoperable. Is the data in a format that can be used by others, like using CSV instead of PDFs, for example? And is it reusable? Is there a license that allows others to reuse the data? So these are the FAIR principles. And they are often discussed in the context of data, but they should also, they apply equally well to software. I will now just briefly show how to, to make your data or your code or both uh, available to the world and get a DOI, a digital object identifier for that, for those data. So DOIs are the backbone of academic reference and matrix systems, right? That's how you cite, uh, that's how you can cite academic output. So how do you do this? Um, Synodo is one option. There are many other platforms which are listed here below, but Synodo is a very popular one. It's a general purpose open access repository created by OpenAir and CERN. It has integration with GitHub and it allows researchers to upload files up to 50 gigabytes. Maybe, I don't know if this has been updated or not. So I'll show you the workflow. If I click this link now, I suspect that I'll get a 502. Yeah, that's because sandbox.synodo is a test platform. It's if you want to play around without making anything permanent, without creating real DOIs. So the sandbox right now is, is not uh, up. Maybe it's being maintained somehow, but I will go to the real platform instead, synodo.org. That brings you here. You see that I'm already signed in actually here. Um, if I go now to GitHub,
what happens. I get some instructions how to get started. So what are the steps? You flip a switch, you create a release, you get a badge. So this is now synced to my GitHub account. And I also have access to these uh, to organizations on GitHub that I belong to, like Codefinery. And these two repositories here already have a DOI. We have already published these here on Zenodo. So we can cite our post workshop survey in this case. But let's say you want to do this with a new repository. You, you want to share some other data and you want to make it publicly accessible and citable. You then scroll down to the repository where you want to, uh, that you want to publish. And you flip the switch here from on, from off to on. I'm not going to do it because this is the real platform now. When that happens, Synodo knows that, okay, this is an active repository. You then go to the respective GitHub account. So in this case, you see there's a button here. You can try this later at home. I, I can follow this link here. It takes me to the actual GitHub repository and it takes me directly to the release page. So the idea here is that you, you, you activate the repository on Synodo, you then go to GitHub and create a release. So you can see if I go to the main page here of this repository, you just go to the release section here. Create a new, a new release. You can call it something. This is version 1.0.1 or 0 0.5 or whatever. You can write a description and then you publish this release by pushing this button here. What happens then is that Synodo, because it has activated this repository, will pull information from GitHub. It will pull it and uh, make it available here on Synodo. And you will then get a DOI. A new DOI will be created for that release. What you can then do is to click that DOI badge, copy paste uh, source code in different formats. So either markdown or restructured text, something like that. We can copy paste this markdown badge now. And what you can then do is to go back to GitHub. So this is all documented in the exercise. So don't worry if this is too fast. You can then go to your repository and add it to your readme file. Maybe I should now show you how this works for the pre post workshop survey, which was one of the activated repositories here. So uh, this is one of the repositories that we in Codefinery have created a release for and published on Synodo. And you see that we have added now the DOI batch here to the readme. I will show you just that how that looks. I just, in this case, we have just copy pasted this markdown text into the readme file. So anyone who now finds our repository, surfs around the web and finds, aha, there's an interesting repository here. They can see that, okay, they've made a release on Zenodo. Here's the DOI and I can cite it now. Okay. Maybe this was very fast. Um, the steps are documented here. It's, it's a straightforward approach and surprisingly easy to create a new DOI and link everything together. So it's a perfect approach to make your, your uh, to, to adhere to the open science principles. So make your data and your code available, create DOI so people can cite you and so on. And as I mentioned, there are many other services for sharing and collaborating on data as well. Here are some examples. And here are some databases for uh, the Nordics where you can upload your data, climate data, geo data, life science, and so on. And finally, some last links, uh, some, uh, some links to for more future reading. You can uh, browse along here if you're interested in, in uh, learning more about reproducibility. And with that, I want to conclude.
so thank you for the attention. Uh, maybe we should stretch our legs for two minutes while uh, Ann sets up and we switch focus to social coding. Thank you, Tor. So should we take the two minutes break or? Yeah, we can take two minutes break. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. Maybe I can start sharing my screen. Yeah, I will spotlight you on. Okay, thanks. Yes, now you are spotlighted. Perfect. Yeah, you can share the screen. Um, is it okay? Can you see it clearly or? I think so. Yeah, okay, that's perfect. Because I, I, I want to be able to switch from different panels. So I, I thought I will keep the presentation like this. Yeah. Not so many minutes, uh, seconds uh, <laughs> more, but uh, I will just show that uh, timer screen. Is it okay that I take yes, over? Yes, that would be perfect. Yeah. So no, you are not supposed to be in breakout room. Uh, it's really no. very short um, break. Okay. Sorry, does this it's maybe too short so that I will I will not share the <laughs> screen. We'll have a breakout exercise at the very beginning, not a very long one, but uh, like a minute. Yeah, okay. So we will start breakout room very soon after you started on. Yes, yeah. yeah good. I would like the, them to discuss about their project and the that will be the only breakout room. Yeah. For me, it's a, it's the right time now. It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I see you had a time or two. Yeah, so we shall uh, start. Um, so this social coding and open software session, uh, it's really about like wrapping up and trying to put uh, in perspective uh, all, all the things we have seen so far in the code refinery workshop and the thing we will see later on. Yeah, so we'll have uh, three uh, parts in, uh, in this uh, uh, episode, we'll have one about the social coding, and I will explain you what we mean by social coding. One about the licensing. So we have seen a bit how um, um, it is important to share with Git Collaborative uh, on, on GitHub, but uh, uh, the importance of licensing is becoming crucial for social coding. And then finally, software citation, and we'll uh, see what, what it means. So the social coding aspect, um, in fact, you know already what is social coding, but we never put a, a name on it. When we did the Git collaborative uh, aspect last week, where we had a repository and we were collaborating uh, with issues and making uh, pull requests and um, uh, changing the code, but uh, through this collaboration, online collaboration, this is what we mean by social coding. So it means we have a, like a social aspect, writing codes, and sharing codes. So this is really what it means, nothing more. It's not very uh, more fancy. And uh, you can put it in perspective with what Tor explained this morning about reproducibility. In the social coding aspect, the code itself is not necessarily only the source code of your project, but it can be like the environment you are sharing, uh, maybe a Docker file, uh, maybe a YAML file for a Conda environment and uh, uh, maybe a workflow with SnakeMix. So this is all about uh, this social coding aspect. We don't only share the code itself, but everything, and we collaborate on, on these different aspects. Um, so here, this is to make an analogy between uh, what is common in research and in research development and academic credit. So in academia, uh, uh, the, credit, uh, the credit goes uh, through papers, so uh, publication, 
and uh, you want to be cited as much as possible. So uh, you, uh, you organize when you make a publication, the main objective is to make it very clear so uh, everyone else can use your paper and build on top of it. But at the same time, most of the time when you write a paper, you are using, you are citing other uh, publications because you don't start from scratch. So the same approach, uh, uh, we'll we will take the same approach for a software. So we want maximum visibility, maximum reuse, and the more interesting science is done uh, if you are referencing your paper, and this is you as a researcher, and the same for your software. If uh, more people are using your software and referencing your software, this is better for you as a researcher or as a research software engineer. Uh, so here I would like you to make, a, we'll make a breakout room and in the breakout room, we'll have 10 minutes and I would like you to discuss about reason for sharing and the uh, reason for not sharing. And here again, the code is uh, all what we have seen before. So the code is a source code. It can be your project, but it can be a Conda environment. It can be um, so a YAML file or Docker file, if this is a Docker. So put everything into perspective. And sharing, it doesn't mean I send you an email with the content of all this information. This is really this informal and formal sharing for instance through a GitHub collaborative platform. So this is what I would like to discuss. Um, and I would like uh, you, if you are in a, um, in a group where you are all working on the same project, take this project as an example. So uh, what you want to share as part of this project and why you are sharing this script, data, code, what, uh, what would be the benefit if you don't do it right now, and reason for not sharing. If there are parts of uh, uh, some aspect in your project you don't want to share, why? Uh, what, uh, if this is uh, for any reason, you can write it down. Uh, you will have 10 minutes and at the end of the 10 minutes, um, so uh, maybe three minutes before the end, uh, make sure the helper or one person per group write a few notes in the HackMD. So we'll make a, a clear in the HackMD where to write it down, but a, a few reasons, three or, or four points for reason for sharing and reason for not sharing. And then we come back to the main room. Um, so is it clear for everyone? Uh, if uh, yes, we can, uh, now you can start opening the breakout room. Yes, I open the breakout room now. Okay, thanks. And we'll send a notification three minutes before the end so you can wrap up and write down some comments. So I don't know if we should have the HackMD, maybe right. Uh, sorry, I cannot see the HackMD. Did we add a section already? Or? Yeah, it's uh, written in at the very bottom. Mm, Group yeah. work reasons for sharing code or data and reasons for not sharing. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So each uh, group, I guess, can write, write it down. So maybe we have... Is it uh, all the group room here? Uh, Sabri is back. Okay. Uh, Should uh, maybe have group one, group... How many groups do we have? Uh, how many? Fourteen today. Okay. Do they know their numbers? Or? Because we could have like group one. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Sabri, I sent you to one of the breakout rooms. Bjorn, I think I already sent you to 19. And Richard to 18. Richard, are you there? 
Yes, I was just doing something before going to the room. Okay. So, yes. See you there. No problem. So, Anne, do you have anything to say to the stream viewers? Uh, well, I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll go through as a different reason for sharing and not sharing. So, I don't know uh, in the stream. They don't have a hack MD, you know, just in the Twitch. Or? Yeah, because we will also go afterwards. Um, so, I, we'll make the pool afterwards, now we? Uh, yeah, we I, have a poll. Uh, but they will not be able to participate, I guess. But then we will go through the benefits. So we will mostly go through, but I will go quite quickly. So maybe mm -hmm. I can already look at them. Yeah. And I, I can see some are already mentioning the benefit for us. Right. Like um, easy to find and reproduce. Mm -hmm. But reproducibility usually doesn't become as at first. Like, <laughs> I could see, I mean, some were mentioning uh, finding bugs. Uh, mm, for their own sake. <laughs> yes, but, it, but it's good. I mean, this is how we should present it. This right. is really, uh, get positive feedback uh, from, exactly. uh, from, uh, from your work. Uh, sharing what is suggested, suggested by committee, which is usually sometimes it's, uh, you are forced mm. to, to share. Getting timestamp for your implementation. Yes. I think I like the fact that you get fresh eyes on your code. That's probably uh, the best way to sell it. <laughs> I don't know if people are, are putting some not reason for not sharing. Uh, let me see. The embarrassment. Aha, yes. Possible yeah. embarrassment. Yeah. It seems like that people are writing uh, yes. for each room and then pros and cons. Yes, uh, but so also that right, reason yes. for not sharing as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Not have them to create the scripts. Generic enough. Yeah, I think that's always uh, one of the major concerns is what you write is not uh, like publishable. Mm. Yeah. But it's always better to share it anyway. Because <laughs> maybe someone will improve it. Yeah. Um, or it's too short still or yes yeah mm. and if you don't have to write to, to time to write to create scripts generic enough usually um you will be the first person to uh, to be annoyed by this because mm. you will have to apply it for maybe another data set mm. or for in, in a different slightly different context so you will change it mm. most likely yeah by the way, that's the I learned from that last Nongit uh, code refinery session that the if you are copying for for example from that uh, stack flow uh, some of the code, and then it is possible, but the uh, you can how do you say uh, you need to mention that or there is some sort of this. Uh, uh, license issue, wasn't it? Or uh, it, it was oh, there not... is no license. I mean, oh, there is a okay. license with Stack Overflow. Yeah. And I think we are mentioning it later on uh, in yeah. the license part. But there is a, a clear license for Stack Overflow. Which yeah, is... that somebody mentioned that it is okay to copy it. Yeah. But uh, I can't remember if it was something like that. You, it was uh, CCBY or totally free. I think no the CCBY. CC by... Uh, it depends on the date, actually. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, so I can just show you. Yeah. And we'll discuss it la later for the license. But uh, you can yes. copy. It's always nice to mention. Mm. So well, it depends on the date uh, you, you publish. Oh, yeah. Software. That's true. Yeah, but the uh, recent one is uh, CC BY. Mm. So, so but you then can you, use it. You need to write in the readme or is it in the code that this is, a, this is this particular or this small part of the code i referred to this code which is written in the stack flow or whatever i mean you don't have to but i think you should it's always better to cite yeah. the but where where do you source. write that reference or the uh, citation i usually put in the comment in the code itself oh, in the section okay. i see that's the most 
reasonable place to put the citation? Uh, I mean, it's not the most visible one. I guess if you want to be really visible, you should put it in um, in your readme. Okay. File to, yeah. Just to mention you have added it. But I also mention it in the code itself. So mm -hmm. when the developer look at it. It's, I see. So it's. I think better. we should send a, maybe a, a message. Yeah. In three minutes, uh, we will close. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So to make sure they're all right, that they're all right. Yes, I sent a message three minutes to go. Patented code is difficult. But uh, again, that this, um, you know, reference citation thing is in the code. Is there some sort of this convention like that as in the normal academic literature? Like you need to, if it was in the academic literature, then you need to write this uh, citation or reference number and then uh, you have yeah. the reference list. But uh, in the code, can you make it in that way? Like for example, uh, well, you can add it in the comments, but uh, usually uh, it's more in the documentation. Than mm -hmm. the I see. Yeah, I think the citation, software citation, is uh, still at the beginning, and uh, mm. we tend to forget to cite software. Mm. Yeah, and I think we should more and more. Um, acknowledge right. software, especially like big open software. Mm. Um, they are getting grants because they have users and mm. because people acknowledge them. Yes. So it's good practice. Yes. I really think that it's, it works or that um, it's best for those who have written that original code to be cited. Yeah. The, exactly the same as this literature. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I see people had uh, more or less the expected uh, comments. Mm -hmm. Sharing. So I will send a message to close the all rooms yes. now. Yeah. yeah. Sorry that uh, I was a bit late. Oh. <laughs> no, but that's fine. I mean, uh, because I don't want to go through everything because I can see they have already discussed many of mm. the different Good. aspects. Yes. We'll wait everyone to be back. Okay. So in 15 seconds from now, they will be back or. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Sharing. Um, so I'm just looking through to make sure I only put emphasis on an aspect we haven't uh, looked in deal with. Okay. So now I guess everybody is back. No, not really back, you pull them out. Not all. <laughs> Get, uh, okay. So I see I must, most room have discussed both pro and cons. Um, we'll not go through every everything you have written. I, I just read it, uh, most of them. Okay, so yes. But before we go through, um, I think we have a pool now. Um, I see in most, most of the time, and we see later, uh, you always have very good intention why, why it's good for sharing and the same reason why it's not a uh, reason for not sharing. And one is coming up is very often embarrassment. Um, where can I stop the pool? Yeah. I would like you, uh, we'll start a pool and I would like you to tell us what is the most uh, embarrassing and um, what is the most uh, um, concerning thing for you when you will share your, your code. So I don't know if I start. Yeah. Um, so in all your discussion uh, at the end, 
uh, things, there are many things coming back uh, very often, like you don't want to expose ugly code. Um, you, you would like uh, people to find uh, uh, bugs, or, but it can be embarrassing. Everything like this, what, what is the most important for you? I, I don't know if I can share the results. Or, uh, yes, you can in the end. When you end the poll, then you can okay. share that. So we'll take a few minutes to make sure you... So we have, it will be sc scooped by someone else. Um, so this is reason for not sharing. It will expose my ugly code. Others may find bugs and mistakes. What if the algorithm is wrong? So what happens if you make a, a publication and then uh, um, you are using a code with bugs? I will get too many questions and do not have time for that. Uh, so Ryan, so yes. there was a question on the chat asking, what is a scoop? Ah, yeah. So it says uh, someone is uh, is stealing your um, your work. Um, so because if you publish your software, maybe you didn't publish a, a paper associated with the software. Yet. If you work fully open, you will have a, a, a license, an open software, and people will be able to take it whenever they want. So maybe they will do a very interesting science and they will uh, steal. So this is what we mean by uh, scooped by someone else. Yeah, I should look at the... Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sabri, because I didn't see the comment. What else do we have? Low quality. A low quality copy will appear. I want to be able to sell this later. Someone else will make money from this. It's too early, uh, and this is what is coming back. So make sure you reply, uh, and I will close the pool just now. Give you a few more seconds to answer. You can see already uh, a few coming. Very often, we'll show the results afterwards. Uh, give you a few uh, five more seconds, and then I close it. So I will close it right now. Uh, share results. So okay. do you see the result? Oops. Yeah, the results are visible. Yeah, OK. So we can see uh, for most people, uh, it's too early. And that you are just prototyping. I will write a version to distribute later. And this is uh, what we see very often. At the, it, you will do it later. Uh, so it's one of the main reasons for not sharing. And the other one is uh, you will expose your ugly code, which is usually coming. So for, for this, uh, it's coming too early. There is never too early. Um, because uh, uh, it's, it's uh, like the process of sharing is, uh, is something, the, the sooner the better. Because if you wait the very end, what do you share? Like the final product, and you don't really share like the history of your project, um, of the different version, maybe all the different books. So the, you, you don't give many information to, uh, to your uh, potential user and developer. So you shouldn't be too scared not to share uh, for this reason. I cannot see my... Here, I'm trying to get control to my. Okay. Can you see um, the slides now? Or? Yes. Yeah, I, I lost the control of my. I need to stop sharing for a while. Maybe uh, I have this ugly. I cannot see my screen, so it's only my own problem, obviously. <laughs> And I will share again. 
And I will share this one. Sorry, this. And, uh, okay. And I will stop share results and I will close it. And I want to move. Uh, so for this, we cannot. I don't know what you see. You don't see me. But no, I see you. Yeah, my uh, my computer is trying to reboot. So <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's a Windows computer, obviously. So okay, I will try to not reboot. I will put it here and I will share. Mm. What you can also do is that somebody else shares the slides and. Oh, yeah, so it should be all right. Okay. Is it all right? Yeah, okay. So I will not, uh, sorry for this, it's a bit, uh, I will not go into uh, uh, details of uh, the benefit for sharing or not sharing because this is mostly, mostly what, uh, what you have discussed during the breakout room. Uh, one thing I didn't see very often, I did, it's good for you, uh, but you, you mention it many times because this is uh, people with fun bugs. So usually um, you should see it as a good way for you. Uh, to get uh, some benefit. And uh, something which we haven't seen many uh, in, in your discussion, it will discourage competitors. So if you want, because you, you were scared to be scooped, but um, the, the, the biggest, uh, in, biggest advantage of sharing is uh, people, if they see you have a big group and people are working on one project, they will join the project rather than starting a new one. So it's always a good, uh, a good uh, way to, to have new collaborators. Um, so sharing is scary. Uh, so we, we discussed a bit this affair of being scoped or uh, expose ugly code and etc. cetera. In, in, in this, for uh, fair to be scoped, we will see that having a license and choosing a proper license can avoid this. Uh, ugly code is, uh, um, I've never seen anyone criticizing codes online, or if they do, and we will see, we always put a code of conduct in the project. So, and we will add the contribution guidelines and we will discuss it later. So you have to uh, prevent yourself of uh, uh, receiving some uh, um, like nasty comments. You want uh, in your project, uh, also to collaborate in this uh, collaborative way, but you want people to be nice to each other. As we have a code of conduct here, we have a code of conduct when you have projects. Funding bug, et cetera, this is all uh, uh, usually very positive, and I will not come back to this. Uh, one thing which we see very often uh, when we share code is I did all the groundwork and they will get the interesting science to do. Um, Sharing code and uh, encouraging, encouraging derivative work will help you to have more impact because uh, it's good practice if you are using a code to cite the, the code and to cite the person who developed the code. So it, it will give you more uh, impact than if you don't share it. And, uh, you may be able to do more science because other people will help you to develop your project. So you will not be the only one who contributes. So it's uh, normally uh, all positive. Um, one note about the journal policy. You know that most journals uh, require you to share your code and data when you publish. And uh, you have some editorial uh, big uh, publisher like Nature. This is uh, for them like a, a, a must. This is by default. However, we know in practice it doesn't work and they are pretty aware that it doesn't really work. So it's not that uh, this is something um, uh, unknown for them. They are trying to, uh, to, I mean, to force you, to encourage people to share data and paper, but we still see some comments like uh, uh, when you want to get the data or the code of, uh, of someone who has published, you need to uh, give an, a lengthy explanation of why you want to get the code, what kind of research you will do with this code, and uh, most, uh, more importantly, if you will cite them when they, you make papers. And this is mostly because in academia, everything is um, 
around publication and citation. But it's, it's improving. So I think we are now in a much better configuration than a few years ago. Um, so we discussed about this social coding. So whenever you want to share, you want to get credit. And as for your paper, you want to be cited. But when we did this Git collaboration, where we have this framework where you can make uh, issues, you can make uh, pull requests, etc. One thing we haven't discussed a lot is about license. And software licenses matter a lot when we do social coding. Because whether you can contribute or not to a, a project mostly depends on the license in the project. And uh, keep in mind when uh, we'll choose license and we'll discuss about license, license uh, is, is mostly maybe for you when you are moving out from your current job. So if you choose a license, choose it wisely. Um, so one motivation, and I think the biggest motivation for open source software is to enable derivative work. So do not lock yourself out of your own code and you try to attract developers who want to be able to show the code uh, I mean, the coding work on their CV. So you will have contributor from outside, uh, maybe don't work in the, in the area, if, uh, if this is clear, how they can contribute to your project. And if this is not open, it will never become a standard. Um, when, uh, when mentioned about code reuse, should you reuse things that others have done? because we are discussing about sharing your code, but most of the time we are reusing code from others. Like all the main libraries in Python, like NumPy, SciPy, etc., you can reuse. They have a license for this. A uh, spe specialized scientific library, random code from website or copy from Stack Overflow, you can use. The, uh, on Stack Overflow, you have a specific and clear license to be able to reuse it. And the question is, how do you turn your small project into uh, a NumPy project, like a big project? So uh, what do you need to do? We have learned technically how to use a Git, for instance, to uh, collaborate, but it will not be sufficient to get contribution. So uh, we'll not do this exercise as a, as a group, but what contributes to you being able to reuse stuff that others make and other uh, being able to reuse your stuff? So as a developer, and we'll see here, as a developer or user, what are you looking at when you discover a new package? So when you go online, will you search and you find a software or a piece of software, it can be a NumPy library or it can be a smaller, what do you look at? Uh, first thing you should look at is the date of the last code change to make sure it's not an abandoned project. Check the release history. So you, we have learned how to do it with Git, for instance. How about the stability and backward compatibility? Do they have the different releases or do they only have a master branch with everything in it and you don't know uh, when things have been changed? So versioning is very important. Number of open pull requests and issues. Do they have hundreds of pull requests, very old, nobody answer? Then it's probably not a good project to start with. Installation instruction, is it easy or not to, uh, to install the package? Do they have examples? Uh, is it easy to understand how to use the software? Because if it's not easy, it's unlikely you will have many users. Uh, license. First thing is, am I allowed to use it? And this is the first thing I would check first before all the dates and the, the history. The first thing I usually check is a license. And the contribution guide. So for, for me, if I want to join a project and I don't know how to contribute to this project, how the decisions are made, who is doing what, who can decide if I make a pull request, if it will be accepted or not, it's not a project I really want to collaborate. Uh, trust and community, um, somebody you trust recommended it. Uh, so it's usually how it happens. Someone say, oh, but by the way, I know a project, you could look at it. And actually, this is what, uh, what we teach in, uh, in, oops, in code refinery. So we have version control, where we have uh, a project management uh, as part of the version control. We have testing, and we will see it, testing, documentation. We have seen a bit of reproducibility, but very quickly. Code citation, we'll look at it just right now. 
and uh, being findable. And we'll see uh, adding some metadata, for instance, in GitHub can help you to be findable and licensing. So now, uh, fair principle, and I will not really uh, go into details. Uh, Tor went very quickly too. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. What does it mean for software? Uh, so findable is usually uh, if you you put your code in GitHub and you put, you put some uh, keywords, it will help to be findable. It's not necessarily findable, fully findable. Accessible if you have contributing guideline, a readme, um, a code of conduct in your project, everything that can help someone to access it in terms of uh, uh, being a, a developer of your project plus everything related to accessibility in terms of usage uh, do you do they have example do they have a clear documentation on how to install um, uh, can we contribute with new examples etc and i will uh, skip the interoperability uh, here uh, and reusability, I just uh, mentioned it. We have more about FAIR in the context of software. It's still a bit unclear uh, how to make a, a software fully FAIR. And FAIR is uh, usually not sufficient for uh, software uh, because you want to, to capture a lot more information than what, is, uh, what are in the FAIR principle. So now uh, we are uh, going to the licensing, which is one key component of social coding. There is no social coding if there is no license. Uh, just uh, uh, to give you a bit uh, the bigger picture about intellectual property. So this is everything related uh, to, to creation. So you have different kinds uh, like uh, patents, but this is not really uh, applying to software. So this is mostly uh, to technical invention or very, very new uh, invention. You have copyrights, so copyrights are usually by default. So you don't need to ask for copyright to have it, and it protects a creative expression. And you have it for software. Every software will have a copyright. And trademark, which is to protect a name. Like we could have a trademark for code refinery, or you could have a trademark for your own project. So both patents and trademarks, you need to go through a process to ask for it, so, and uh, there is a procedure and you have a cost for patent and trademark. Copyright, there is no procedure. You will get a copyright by default. So that's the only, the most biggest difference. Um, so here we, uh, we again go back to copyright and uh, in more details. Uh, and it's quite important for software because you always have copyright. So it means it is automatically created and the uh, derivative works usually inherit copyright. So this is important for a software. And the, in terms of time frame, this is forever, which is not the case, for instance, for patents. When can you use uh, copyright? So when, uh, where there is a license, say you can, uh, otherwise it's quite limited. Um, just an, a mention of derivative work, what we mean by derivative work. So uh, we mean by derivative work, everything about changing, remixing, remixing and covering. So this is uh, what, what we mean. So for instance, here you can recognize a joke on, uh, is it a derivative work in that sense? So if you build something, on something, you form a derivative work. So it means uh, the original creator may have rights to what you make. The whole point of this talk is to make sure you can make and publish derivative work. So everything about social coding and open software is about derivative work. So it's not only having a release of the software, it's uh, to make sure people can build on top of it and create new, uh, maybe extension. Um, so which of these is derivative work? If you download some code from a website and add, add a, on, to, on it. So you could reply for yes and no. In, by yes and no, can I see in the participant? Yeah. Can you, uh, do you think it's a, it, it is a derivative work? Yes or no? To download some code from a website and add on, on it.
So we have mostly yes for this. And it is, uh, yeah, it is indeed der derivative work. And here, when you download some code, we have seen most of the time, uh, we, we can reuse the code and extend it. I will clear it. Uh, and and then, um, for instance, if you download some code, but this time you use the function in your code. So using a function, is it derivative work or not? Yeah. So using uh, everything related to using a function or using a library is uh, is 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 not a derivative work in that sense. I will skip the change in the code or extending the code because changing the code and extending the code is there uh, are both derivative work. So if you completely let's clean, I will clean it because I still it's important that one. If you completely rewrite the code, is it derivative work or not? And here, this is a, a, a bit uh, tricky. Um, and we usually have exactly what we have now, like 50-50. People think this is derivative work and the same amount will think this is not derivative work. So if you completely rewrite the code, if you have seen the code, it is derivative work. Um, but And this is what we call clear room design. Somebody explain you the code but have never seen it, then in that case, this is not derivative work. Um, so it's, a, it's very, uh, like there is a thin boundary between the two. Uh, if, and the same, if you rewrite the code uh, in a different language, it is still declarative work. So if you copy pass, but you're just changing from, uh, I don't know, Python to R, it will be still derivative work. And finally, if you read, I will clean it. If you read a paper and you understand the algorithm and write your own code, in that case, uh, it's, uh, it's not a derivative work because you don't even have the code. And this is really at the algorithm level. And it is usually it's very hard anyway to do this. Um, then I will move on. Um, so here I will skip it. This is what you mentioned in uh, in your discussion. What uh, what would what, why is it uh, useful to uh, to share? And you have a, a good discussion on this. Uh, want to mention about free software? When we say free software is, uh, is uh, the freedom to, to run the software for any purposes so to make new application, to study how the software works uh, and without having to uh, reinventing the wheel, to redistribute copy of the software, to have more user or to improve the software. So free software doesn't mean there is no cost. So it doesn't mean the software is for free. You, you can pay a free software in that sense. And uh, in uh, in uh, I mean, many companies are using this as a business model. They have open source, but uh, they are still having, like, points of the handling fee. And the open source license doesn't mean you need to share everything immediately. So you can choose what you want to share. And you can choose a condition. So here, this is a list of different kinds of software licensing. So software licenses is very important, and you have to choose uh, a proper license. And the proper license, it mostly depends how the, on the, the condition for the derivative work. Um, the only thing here you need to remind is avoid custom or closed license. It's very difficult to see the different compatibilities if you choose your own license. Uh, it will not encourage others to build on top of your software. So this is his first license. You have very permissive license, like the MIT license, BSD or Apache, they are very, very permissive. So uh, it means the derivative work does not have to be shared. So I can take a, a software from, with the MIT license, can make something completely new and make even uh, may, may, maybe money on top of it. Uh, I don't have to share back to you. Uh, you have a different uh, weak 
uh, copy left share alike licenses like the LGPL and MPL. So here in that case, the derivative work is free software, but is only limited to the component. So it means if you integrate it in a, another a bigger project, you don't have uh, to share everything, but only this component. Well, the strong copyleft uh, share alike, like the GPL and AGPL, here the derivative work is free software and the derivative work extends to the combined project. So everything you will make on top of, uh, of this uh, initial software will have to, uh, to comply and uh, be free software. So it's a very quick, a super quick summary of all the different licenses. Uh, we have a lot more about licensing. We have a lesson, completely uh, independent lesson on uh, licensing you can look at. Um, and uh, you need to be aware that uh, uh, the person who can decide uh, or change a license is a copyright holder. And who owns the copyright holder for a software you write? It really depends on your country and on your employer. So it's really better to check before uh, you, you do and add a license. Most universities in the Nordic don't really have um, a policy. So if you own your own software, you can change a license and you can have a dual license. You can have a, a GPA license for everyone, for instance, and then you have a pay for license for non-GPL for commercial. Uh, I will skip this one. Here we have some practical recommendations for license, uh, which you, you can look at. Important to remember, uh, having a license is usually not sufficient. Have a readme file, have a contributing and code of conduct guideline is a must, as a, along with a license. If you want to uh, give the license, the license gives you uh, an information on how you can make derivative work, but it's really, um, uh, important to have some contributing guidelines to see uh, how you want to get this contribution back. Uh, I will skip this. Um, and then I want to go to software citation, which is a uh, very last important part. We said we can collaborate with each other. We know how to collaborate. We can uh, use contributing guidelines to uh, have a code of conduct in the project to, to make sure we frame this collaboration and this social coding environment. But the last thing you want to be uh, acknowledged for the work you do and you want to be cited. And you can cite software. So how do you cite software? So um, we mentioned already using a DOI, getting a DOI with Zenodo, and I saw mention it. Uh, open, license, open source license can't demand citation. So it's, it's really hard to enforce it but it's a, it's a good practice to do it. And every time if you go in a, in a, in a documentation and there is a how to cite a section, usually everyone will follow it. So make it easy for everyone else to cite your software. So we recommend to use this citation file format, which is a small text format, uh, where you will uh, give some information about uh, the author, the title, the version, and the DOI, very important to get a DOI, and the date of the release. And if you have this uh, small file placed in your, in your software, it will really help everyone else to cite your, your software. So we cannot enforce it, but you can facilitate it. So make sure you make everything you can to, uh, to get contributors for your project, but also to get citation. And uh, be aware that you have uh, uh, papers where you can only publish software so it's only about the software itself so you don't really need to wait for the very end you can as soon as you have a release you can make a publication for your software and then you can make a, a scientific publication where you use this software where to place your code we uh, we uh, discuss it you can place it in github gitlab or uh, the code refinery uh, public or private repository are available too um, so making code public is not enough you know you need to have a license you need to have contributor guidelines you also need to get a dui and a citation and that thing that's it that's a conclusion uh, of this uh, of this very short and quick talk license your code very early and don't wait and don't postpone it 
uh, it's uh, ideally you should uh, do it at, uh, even before uh, anything goes uh, public. Make it easy to cite your project, get a DOI, make a citation file. Uh, and uh, uh, I think I will finish with this. You can have discussion. I think if you have a project, it's always good to have some discussion on uh, what to license, how to license, how to improve your project uh, uh, collaboration uh, in uh, how to add contribution guideline, what this contribution guideline would, uh, would, would contain, uh, how to improve a readme, etc. And uh, I will finish here because I'm always a bit over time. So sorry for this. If you have any question, please add it in the, in the, in the etherpad. And uh, per group or per project, I think it would be interesting if you could add one thing you will change in your project. Um, taking into account what you have learned today. So what uh, what would you do? Like for instance, would you add uh, uh, would you use Conda as an environment or to, to facilitate deployment? Would you use uh, Docker, etc.? Would you just add a README file? One thing uh, you would improve in your project if you could add it in the uh, in the uh, HackMD, sorry, at the very bottom as a feedback of this morning session to see how uh, it, it was useful and that. Otherwise, that's, that's it from me. I don't know what else we need for wrapping up. We'll meet again tomorrow. And can I have a quick question? Of course. So from the, from the Hackapad and from the chat, it seems uh, many people are using private uh, repositories. It means that they have your code somewhere on the internet, but it's only visible for them. So yeah. what do you think? Is, is, it, is, it, uh, is it a social way to code, have your private repo? Uh, so you can have private repos, repository and if you are a team, you can do social coding within your team. They still are called social coding. You, you always need to question uh, the license, even if this is a private repository, because if you have several collaborators and they are in your group, you still need to, uh, uh, to, to define the condition, uh, especially when people are leaving the group. And uh, uh, I would always uh, question myself, why is it private? Why do we want to have it private? Um, so it can have, we can have very good reason, like uh, uh, some uh, software cannot be published because uh, the initial license doesn't allow it. But it, it means you will build some work on something which is not visible to anyone. So you will not be cited. You will not be acknowledged for the work you do and the development you do in the software. So uh, keep it in mind. Uh, in your in view, in the code refinery, when we talk about social coding, it's, uh, it's really participating into open software, so fully public software with proper license for collaborating and can have some restriction on the license, but still open. Uh, so, and is it difficult to select a license? Will GitHub, for example, help me to find my license, the correct one for me, or should I be a, like a legal expert for that? Yeah, we are hopefully don't need to be a legal expert. I don't remember if we showed um, if we showed it already. Maybe it, it was too quickly. So there are uh, in in GitHub when we you create a repository, uh, you have the possibility to choose a license. So if your software is a, if this is a software a code. Usually you have the list. Uh, I don't know if you could share it. I could maybe uh, show in GitHub. I will. Uh, so you have in GitHub and you have this uh, choose a license website. Share screen. Like this. Uh, if I create a new repository. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, large enough to, for you, but here you see you have this uh, license section where you can choose the different section. And uh, if you want to know what it means behind, so for each repository, they will give you, uh, I don't know if I can, I should take this social coding.
usually see the license here on the right hand side for every repository uh, having a license and if you click it usually uh, gives you the full detail of the license what it means and here you have a summary of what you are allowed to do the permission and the limitation and the condition so uh, here's the state changes and etc so here all the material for um, code refinery we are using this Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 international license because it's not source code, but it's text. Uh, and you can also use choose a license.com. We probably can add it. And here they help you to distinguish if you need to work in a community or my project is not a software. I want it uh, simple and permissive, and they will give you the different licenses you can choose. Here's an MIT license and then you can uh, add your uh, um, github repository and it will add it automatically so that's another way if you forgot if you have an existing project and you forgot um, does it answer is there, is there anything i i forgot mm, please that was very nice and yes that's very helpful so because there's a guide so we don't have to worry much about um, yes, the legal so aspects. There are, we don't really have to uh, uh, bother about this legal aspect, um, except if this is a big project and you, you need to handle it with, because you have many different partners. Uh, and the, I mean, legal, uh, if, for instance, if you ask your university what, uh, what license you should use, uh, you usually a very little uh, help from them because they, there is no clear recommendation in academia on which license to use. So it's uh, usually easier to go, for instance, in the choose a license or to follow recommendation uh, by, by GitHub. So saying, what do, you, do I want? Do I want people to, uh, to be able to give me back contribution or not? Uh, this is a kind of question, but uh, don't expect a legal person to help you to, to choose. And think about uh, most of the time, the person who will be the software who will be using the software is you, and is you maybe in another life. So when we you change work, so make sure you don't lock yourself, and make sure you can reuse the software you have written where you were when you were at university. Um, and that uh, that's it. There are no other questions. I think we can uh, reconvene tomorrow, same time at nine, and uh, we'll do like usual. We'll uh, still be open, and uh, if you have any other question, we'll uh, we'll reply and help you in comment. So we we'll stop sharing. Maybe we stop the recording. I don't know if we usually keep it. Um, uh, and it's also good to remind the feedback. Oh yes, sorry. You can uh, write the feedback, which is uh, at the end. I think I forgot. Maybe most people are left already. At the, end, at the very end of the HackMD, if you could put one positive uh, and one thing we can improve for today. So there are many things we are quite new in the way we, we did it, and especially online. So please, um, if you could give constructive feedback on how we can improve. Uh, or what uh, things you really liked and they work quite well for you online. So it's, it could be very helpful because it's uh, quite different from what uh, we usually do um, where you have lots of exercises. And I think we should remind people tomorrow for uh, feedback because I forgot. That's all right. That's for tomorrow. Yes, yeah, yes, because I, I forgot. I don't know if someone else wants to, to discuss something. Yes, so shall I close the stream and recording now? Yes, I think so. Yeah, okay.